Aeon the Perception in Action podcast, a review of the paper, How to Coach, a review of theoretical approaches for the development of a novel coach education framework, which incorporates self-determination theory, explicit learning, and implicit learning. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Now on to the show. Hi, everyone. In this week's episode, I want to review a paper by Kevin Smith, which also includes former podcast guests Nick Wickelman and Ed Cullen as co-authors. This paper seems to be an attempt to integrate some of the approaches that are currently being argued and debated in the field of skill acquisition, in particular, the CLA and direct explicit instruction. But we'll get to that. The authors begin by evaluating the current state of affairs. Quote, Sports coaching is dominated by these so-called traditional approaches that can be usually be summarized as being highly directive, autocratic, and prescriptive, with the relevance of many practice activities used by coaches being unsubstantiated towards improving sports performance. It has been suggested that a primary contributing factor to this lack of development is the conventional approach of coach education, which usually focuses on the content of what to coach without necessarily providing the practitioner with the appropriate tools regarding how to coach it. From here, the authors introduce their new framework. The Irish Rugby Football Union has developed a novel coach education framework that has the potential to address some of the perceived shortfalls in the current coach education landscape. This holistic coach education framework aims to educate practitioners to develop purposeful, game-centered practices that will challenge the athletes to develop their core skills and game understanding in an enjoyable learning environment. And quote, this coaching education framework aims not only to improve a coach's technical, tactical knowledge relative to their behaviors, but also provide them with interpersonal, intrapersonal tools to apply the framework's content in sporting scenarios that are appropriate to the recipient cohort. The framework brings together what the authors call three different theoretical constructs. First, self-determination theory, Second, explicit learning theories, which we'll see in a second the authors equate to verbal instruction or cueing. And three, implicit learning theories, which we will see shortly is pretty much just the CLA. Going into more detail. In an applied coaching setting, self-determination theory can function through a myriad of methods, such as coaches providing a rationale for practice activities, empowering their athletes with choices regarding what takes place during training session, asking them thought-provoking questions to enhance their learning experience, and the use of non-controlling language to promote freedom of expression throughout the practice. Explicit learning theory focuses on verbal knowledge of performance that involves cognitive stages in the learning process that are reliant on working memory engagement. With verbal instruction cues and feedback, the primary types of performance-related communication used in the applied setting by a coach. The coach can use language through either instructions or cues to direct an athlete's focus of attention which is defined as a conscious effort of an individual to focus their attention through explicit thoughts in an effort to execute a motor skill or movement pattern with optimal performance. Finally, implicit learning theory relates to learning that occurs through practice that accentuates task involvement and reduces explicit information. This leads to an understanding of cadence, sequence, and implementation of a task or movement pattern that is measured through performance, but not through recall. Implicit learning theories are associated with several different approaches to coaching and teaching, such as game-based approaches and teaching games for understanding. Another prominent implicit learning theory method for coaches is to adopt a constraints-led approach, which suggests that motor behavior emerges as a product of the interaction of the constraints inherent to an athlete's own body, their environment, and the task demands. A CLA to coaching involves selecting training variables during a sporting practice session to achieve a desired outcome. Space, time, rules, and equipment constraints can all be used in a coaching setting to achieve a desired skill or developmental outcome for the athlete. End quote. So I think it's very good that the authors have highlighted the important role the interaction between the athlete and the coach plays and have emphasized the key role motivation plays. I also like that they acknowledge that coaching is more than just setting up a practice activity and standing back and doing nothing. More on this in a bit. Next, the authors consider some practical applications of the three different theories. 
Quote, some practical coaching behaviors that can aid in creating an environment that utilizes signal detection theory as a focal point could also include free time during the practice session to allow the athlete to practice self-determined areas of strength or weaknesses, to empowering the athlete to choose a training activity from a coach-selected list of activities, that is controlled choice, three, providing a session objective or goal at the beginning of practice coupled with a rationale as to how this will aid in improving the athlete's performance, Four, having a coach with the emotional intelligence to listen to athletes' feedback during the session and implement athlete feedback in future sessions. And finally, five, avoid controlling behaviors and judgmental terms that coerce or shame the athlete into performing a training task in a particular fashion. In terms of practical application of explicit learning theories, the authors state, the first step requires that the coach to identify what they perceive as the athlete's limiting factor for the desired movement pattern or sporting action. Once this perceived shortfall has been identified by the coach, the second step involves formulating a corrective, externally focused cue that includes a describing verb to tell the athlete how to do the action, e.g. jump, a distance reference point, how close or far the external focus is, and a movement direction if the athlete is moving towards or away from the external focus. Using a jumping action as an example, the coach could instruct an athlete to jump as high as possible to touch the sky where description, distance, direction are all provided to the athlete through external focus in order to complete the action as effectively as possible. Where description, distance, and direction are all provided to the athlete through an external focus in order to complete the action as effectively as possible. Finally, in terms of the practical application of implicit learning theories, the authors state, quote, During sport practice, performers should be allowed to explore the performance environment and discover affordances for specific athlete performance behaviors. Performers who are encouraged to explore a replication of the performance environment are likely to discover affordances they can use to regulate behaviors specific to the performance environment. Variability refers to variations that are observed between individuals and emerge within individuals in different reiterations of a performance task over time. By perturbing the learning environment, practice variability encourages the performers to explore multiple movement solutions and transfer from one movement pattern to another. Participants exposed to continuous manipulations like those advocated through the CLA in movement executions, variability of practice, and an emphasis on exploration demonstrate superior learning effects than performers who engage, who engage in traditional learning approaches. End quote. Before I talk about how the author suggests we integrate these things, in my opinion, we have already integrated all of these things into one theoretical framework. It's called ecological dynamics. As I discussed back in episode 433, Self-determination theory and the importance of intrinsic motivation are already fully incorporated by the ecological approach, in particular in nonlinear pedagogy. These can be seen in the concepts of letting behaviors emerge through a process of self-organization instead of prescriptive coaching, co-adaptive practice design, and representative design in which games are kept intact instead of breaking it apart. Furthermore, as the authors describe it, using cues and verbal instructions with an external focus of attention is also well incorporated with ecological dynamics. As Newell and Raganathan have so nicely elucidated, cues and verbal instruction can be considered to be just another form of a task constraint. I'm not really sure why we need to bring in traditional cognitive stages theories of skill acquisition to understand how cues are processed when they could just be considered as another type of constraint. It seems to me that one of the things we see when looking at the external focus of attention and analogy literature are the best cues are not ones that are overly prescriptive. They are ones that allow for self-organization. They focus more on the outcome of the movement than exactly how it is produced. For example, in the example the authors gave earlier, jump as high as possible to touch the sky, there's no real detail about how to do this. You're letting the athlete self-organize by giving them a constraint in terms of the movement to be produced. Indeed, in the last part of the paper, the authors talk about how the three parts of the framework can be integrated. Quote, a non-linear pedagogy methodology could be used to facilitate the implementation of the coaching education framework in an applied setting. Non-linear pedagogy emphasizes the interaction between the participant and the environment through the use of a modified games activities that adopts the principles of repetition without repetition. This methodology also allows coaches to design rich dynamic learning environments through a CLA that are representative of the environments that occur in competitive setting. Using these performance simulations, the coach can enhance the learning of the individual athletes 
and afford them opportunities to discover solutions and rep in representative practice scenarios. The learning process in nonlinear pedagogy focuses on using a constraint side approach to, in order to augment the source of information that are used to guide participants towards finding solutions for themselves. Manipulating key informational constraints allows players to discover alternative movement behaviors during performance. This approach also advocates the coach as a facilitator who empowers the athletes to solve problems and make decisions through themselves. So yes, it all comes together in the ecological dynamics approach. I don't think we need to treat cues as something different, as something that are explicitly processed through cognitive stages and kind of connecting it with information processing. They can equally well be understood, and the literature seems to show that the best ones fit well with just considering them as constraints. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakeyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including a monthly coaches meetup, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.